Good morning, students. <clears throat> I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, I appreciate your uh, attention to, to your work and to meeting your deadlines. That's always a good thing for a math professor to know that, that his students are, are working and, and following the directions and the guidelines. I appreciate that. Uh, math courses are challenging and they keep you busy every day. And so um, thank you for your industry and for your willingness to, to learn a subject that, that will eventually have many rewards. Uh, just like most disciplines, uh, you never stop learning. There's always something new to learn. And as you acquire more math skills and take more engineering and physics and uh, classes that you STEM, uh, mathematics that is, <clears throat> you'll always want to learn new things. And so, so that's really what keeps you moving in an educational realm. Uh, when, when you get to the point when you want to stop learning, uh, th that's usually a very uh, eye-opening event and, and maybe not the most pleasant. So as long as you love to learn and you want to continue to grow, you'll be in excellent shape. Now, what I want to do today <clears throat> is talk about uh, the remaining trigonometric graphs, uh, basically how we will use what we already know to develop some parent functions for the remaining four and do a couple of examples that utilize the same techniques that we uh, used when we did the sine and cosine graphs. Again, not a very you know, elaborate problem, maybe a little bit dry and boring, but, but the nice thing is, is that the techniques allow you to solve problems and get visuals on things in science and engineering uh, where the calculus is not as useful. Depending on the complexity of the function, Certain functions are best uh, understood uh, utilizing these transformation techniques. Now, of course, we'll learn more calculus and, and, and not have to accept everything on faith, at least some of the parts that we have been. Uh, but when you get to calculus, all of those, uh, that, all of that unease will be put to rest. And then after that, um, unfortunately, we have to define, I say unfortunately because it's another leap of faith we have to define the inverse trig functions. And for the most part, everything will be completely succinct, but we will utilize some aspects about the functions that we must assume in order to construct a one-to-one -one function. So again, uh, we, we'll say, well, this function increases on this domain, but it would really rely on the calculus to be able to verify that. So, so unfortunately, we can get almost there, 90% there, and then the other 10% will have to rely on what we uh, learn in calculus. But remember, everything that we develop in this class will be utilized in your calculus sequence, and everything will be correct. So, so you can realize that what you will be taking with you will be good information. Now, the first thing I want to do, I want to share my screen so we can talk about the tangent function and the cotangent function. And what I've done here is I've set this up in a very intuitively friendly way to, to keep everybody on the same page. Remember, we, we have the sine and cosine functions, but now we want to be able to actually create the parent functions for cotangent and tangent um, utilizing what we know about sine and cosine. And what I've developed here is just a way to think about these functions uh, in a very, very simple way. Let's just recall that cosine and sine have a period two pi or any, any multiple of two pi will cause the sine and cosine to, to repeat. So I just want to, just to remind you about that. When you say cosine of x plus some multiple of two pi, where n is an integer, we get cosine x. And then the same is true for sine. So if we have sine of x plus two pi times n, that will equal sine x. So this is, this is the periodic nature that we have for sine and cosine. And we know that the, the smallest 
such positive number is 2 pi based on the unit circle. So if we add 2 pi or any multiple, integer multiple of 2 pi to the argument x, the outcome is not changed. Now, that, that's, again, that is what we call a periodic function. So when we talk about periodic functions, ladies and gentlemen, we're only interested in graphing a complete cycle. And so the cycle would have to have a length, interval length of 2 pi, if that indeed would happen to be the uh, period. For instance, we know when we graph certain functions, the, the uh, period may grow or it may compress, diminish. And so one complete cycle is all we need. Now, with this said, with the period being 2 pi for sine and cosine, you would expect, obviously, that the period, it would also be a period for tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. Now, what we're going to see today is that we can actually decrease the value from 2 pi to pi for tangent and cotangent. And I'll show you why that is the case. So what I've tried to do here is do a real simple uh, intuitive derivation of the principal branch for the tangent and the cotangent just by utilizing uh, the graphs for sine and cosine. Now, the, the interesting thing is, is that when we, when we think about tangent and a principal branch, what we're gonna do is look at two zeros of the cosine function that we find between what? Negative pi over two and pi over two. We know those two inputs for cosine give a cosine of zero. And so for the tangent function, they define vertical asymptotes of necessity. That is pi over two and negative pi over two are zeros of cosine that aren't zeros of sine. So by definition, they define vertical asymptotes. Now, here's how we do it. The periodicity of the unit circle basically says that all we really need to do is look at one piece because as we move into another set of vertical asymptotes, the sign convention works out to be the same and the values are the same. So that's one thing about taking ratios that's gonna trim down the amount of work we have to do. So how do we, how do we get the graph? Well, let's just look at it this way. At zero here, and you can mark this in if you want, zero, we have sine of zero divided by cosine of zero. That's zero over one. So tangent of zero is just zero. And now when we think about this, we've got these vertical asymptotes here. And then just like in a calculus class or any class that uses vertical asymptotes, we know that the function would become unbounded as we approach that particular value, that real number. And so we would just need to assign a plus or minus to infinity. So as we look here and we approach pi over two from the left, we see we go up here and see, well, what's the sine of the sine function and the cosine function? Well, the sine function is positive and the cosine function is also positive. So what we see here is that the function will just creep up and ascend to infinity. Now you're thinking, well, Professor Ron, you drew, you drew a nice smooth curve. Well, that's calculus. It's not going to be jagged. And what we're going to find is that, that the tangent function will be nice and differentiable where it is defined. And so it's going to have a nice smooth curve here. So that's the calculus part that we're kind of taking on faith. But again, after you study enough of calculus and you understand the calculus of the trig functions, all of this will be completely clear to you and you can take this graph as the actual truth. Now, again, we're thinking, okay, well, what happens as we are to the left of zero? Well, notice here that when we move into that particular region, the cosine function here is still positive, but the sine function is negative. So we would expect the graph of tangent to be below the x-axis, but now, as we approach, in this case, pi over two from the right, again, we have the cosine being positive and the sine being negative for a negative value. And therefore we attach the negative sign to infinity. So we see the graph descends to negative infinity. 
So now, again, we see, well, okay, well, that this same analogy would work if we just shift it over to another set of asymptotes and we'd get the same graph. So what we're seeing here is that the periodicity of the tangent function is even one better. It will cycle every, uh, every interval length of pi if we're just dealing with a standard tangent function. And so once we map out a function cycle of length of the period, in this case pi, we're done. All the other pieces will look exactly like this, which we can append and move over. So, so the nice thing about the tangent function is that it still cycles at two pi, but we can go one more, actually an improvement to pi. So now we can think of this, we can write this tangent of x plus any multiple of pi in pi will still be tangent of x. So all this stuff we've done with uh, reference number and period and all this stuff with the with the unit circle i mean we will continue to do even with the inverse trig function so so if you spent some time on that good for you because comfort with that will will pay off handsomely now so so we're thinking all right so how can we basically summarize this we have this nice principal branch here and at least intuitively it appears that it increases throughout the interval negative pi over two to pi over two. And so again, this is where we say, okay, it looks or appears that way, but in calculus, we will be able to prove that the derivative is actually positive on this interval and therefore the function is, is increasing. So, so again, it's not a huge leap of faith here, but we see that just by simple construction with ratios of sine to cosine, we can intuit this graph, and this gives us a nice representation of, of the visual of the tangent function. Now, let's just go ahead and summarize what we have here. Again, put this on a note card, just like for the, uh, when we do the inverse trig, just to have them ready, just to kind of wash yourself of them. You wake up in the morning and you look at the graphs and boom, they're up here, just keeping this information percolating in your brain. So now, from the vertical asymptotes, basically, we can define the domain. We simply are interested in x not being able to take on values of pi over two or odd multiples of pi over two. So what I did here is simply factor the pi over two like we've done before, and we just get this odd multiple here. This is an odd number, integer-wise. And so another thing, too, that we can intuit by the fact that the function becomes unbounded in the negative and the positive direction is that it makes sense that the actual range of the function would be all real numbers. We'll cover all real numbers here. So this is starting to look like the, the logarithm function, but it appears the way this function is reacting is that it, it, it blows up pretty fast. Now, another thing that we wanna notice like I've done here, just to kind of compensate for what we've done for the domain, we can strictly write down the vertical asymptotes as vertical lines. So X would simply be the vertical lines represented by the odd multiples of pi over two. Again, where N is an integer. So, so this gives us a nice representation of the principal branch of the tangent function. Again, by taking ratios appearing between the two graphs, we can basically construct a relatively good uh, representation of the graph of the tangent function. Now, again, it's probably not gonna be any surprise here. I'm gonna go ahead and write this down. The cotangent will react the same way. That is pi or any multiple of pi will actually work as a period. Again, Lots of times when, when someone says, what's the period? They're referring to that smallest positive number. But you know very well that, that any number that does this can be called a period. We just kind of give the, the least positive 
a real number a distinguished status, so to speak. But, but again, there is no common convention. If you see this, you, you go here. If you see this, you write this. You simplify your life because you know uh, the period, periodic nature of all of these functions. Now, so we've got this principal branch. Let's do the same thing, ladies and gentlemen, for the uh, cotangent function. Now, what's cotangent? Again, <clears throat> we're gonna look at this, <coughs> excuse me, as a ratio, but we're going to focus on a principal branch between two zeros of the sine function, and they're gonna be x equals zero and x equal pi. These are what we call the standard branches, the, the principal branches of these functions. And so first, what we'll do is we will look at the ratio cosine to sine. You're thinking, well, why don't we just invert this graph? You know, you've inverted graphs before. Well, I wanna go ahead and do the same argument here because it's really easy. And then we'll invert for the secant and the cosecant. Now, again, if we think of the ratio of cosine to sine, right in the middle here is pi over two. So I'm just gonna notate that. So when we divide cosine of pi over two divided by cosine of pi, excuse me, sine of pi over two, that's zero divided by one, which gives us zero. So this kind of mimics what we have over here, but it's shifted. And now, same thing, where the cotangent function is defined, we're gonna have a nice differentiable curve. We're gonna have a nice smooth curve. Now, how do we assign the uh, values or the, the, the actual sign to the uh, infinity. We do the same thing we did before. So let's notice here, as we approach from the right, the zero here, we can move up here and say, oh, okay, okay. Well, notice cosine is positive and sine is positive. It's approaching zero, but it's still positive to the right of zero. So this gets the positive infinity. So the graph ascends to positive infinity again, in a nice smooth fashion. Kind of looks like a, a, cubic, a cubic curve, like this one does. Not the same, but similar. And now, of course, we can approach pi from the left. That is approach pi from the left, and then we go up here and check this sign. We know this is a vertical asymptote, so the function becomes unbounded. It will be plus or minus infinity. So we check up here and say, okay, well here, the actual uh, sine function is positive, but the cosine function is negative. So that means that we attach a negative sign to infinity, and then the function graph ascends, or excuse me, descends to negative infinity. So, so the idea here is that when we look at the graphical ratio of the two functions, we can easily see how we get that one principal branch. And then if we were to shift over, we have the same sign convention and the same actual values output. So again, excuse me, we get the improvement, we get the improvement of the period. We are able to decrease the standard period of two pi down to pi. And then we have this equation like I've written here. So what is the summary that we have? Well, of course, the domain of the cotangent function would exclude all zeros of sine. So that would be integer multiples of pi. Weber sign likes to use n. Some books use a k for, for uh, natural numbers or integers. It doesn't matter. If they say use an n, use an n. You know Weber sign requires that you use a particular letters and there's no, there's no problem with that. We, we, we have to be consistent in our notation. So as you read the problem, be sure to use the letter uh, that is uh, specified. And so then, just like with the tangent function, the function becomes unbounded uh, to positive infinity and negative infinity. So it would make sense that the range would be all real numbers. Again, again, the calculus will verify this. There will be no values of x for which the function is undefined here. So there's nothing to leave out. And infinity is bigger than any real number and negative infinity is less than any real number. So that pretty much covers it. It's, it's amazing we define vertical asymptote and we get a lot of mileage out of that. And then of course, we can just simply notate 
the vertical asymptotes as x equal integer multiples of pi. So, so the key here, ladies and gentlemen, is just to look at these graphs in terms of ratio. You can always think about different ways to make a graph from given graphs. And I found that when I look at the graphs this way, it's easy for the students to understand the sign convention. And, and then it's easier for them to see the vertical asymptotes. So what, how does this impact doing a trig or a cotangent graph, uh, excuse me, a tangent graph or a cotangent graph? Well, a little bit less work. So if we're going to use the transformation process, Simply, we would just want to do the principal branch. What happens to the principal branch? So we would need to move or adjust the vertical asymptotes here and here and move the point there. And then, of course, if you want an additional point, I just wrote like the point pi over four comma one. That's an easy point if you wanted to move that. That's always nice to have around, um, especially if you do a reflection in the x-axis just so you've got the curve oriented correctly. Otherwise, this point would be enough. So there's really a little bit less to do than the sine and the cosine function. So again, what we have to remember is that certain transformation uh, may not affect the vertical asymptotes. So we don't do anything to them, but we're sure to change the asymptotes when they are affected, especially when we have these horizontal um, compression and stretching that affects the vertical asymptotes. The terminology, unfortunately, doesn't always help us. You know, the, the, the thing about math is that we are precise, but, but everything that we say cannot be intuited in a very simplistic way, unfortunately. So we have to keep track of what we're doing. Now, what I want to do is a simple example of the uh, types of uh, graphs that I'm talking about. Now, the first one I think I've got here is a tangent function. So let's do that. Let me move this over and get some extra paper. And I want to look at the following example here. I took these from your uh, web assign. So we have the following function that is graph using transformations. So graph using transformations. So when we look at this, here's the problem that we have. We have y equals tangent of 2x minus two pi over three. Now this one's not as busy as some we've done, but it's always good to practice um, with, the, with the techniques that we learned with the sine and the cosine. Now, one thing that we've noticed, um, we don't really care about amplitude with these functions that become infinite negatively and positively. The, the term amplitude doesn't make any sense because it's not a bounded function. So that one kind of loses its impact for these functions. But the K, the period, the shifting and all, that's the same. That, that does not change. So, so we will still continue to talk about that. And with that in mind, we would certainly need to factor the two here. So we get tangent. So we have two times X minus pi over three. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, this is good. It looks like we've got a uh, compression, so to speak, uh, horizontally, and then we have a right shift. So that's just two transformations. And then this will give us good practice moving the points and the asymptotes. And again, you'll do the same for every problem that you do that, that involves either tangent or cotangent. So let's write down the mapping. So nothing has changed. We always want to write down the mapping so we know exactly what to do to the objects in the principal graph. So the first thing to do is to get the x into 2x. So we're going to do an h compression by 2. 
So that means we replace x with 2x. Okay? And now, this is our goal, so we need to replace x with x minus pi over 3. So that'll be a right shift by pi over 3. So this will give us tangent to x minus pi over 3, right there. So this gives us the mapping of what's going on. So just like we had before, if we were doing sine or cosine, we look at those five principal points and see what happened to them. Now, when we think about this, We don't have a negative on the outside, so we can just look at what happens to these two asymptotes and this point. So now we have x equals negative pi over 2, and then we have x equals pi over 2, and then of course we have the point 0, 0. So we'll do our first transformation. So we have H compression by two. So all the X values are divided by two or multiplied by one half. So we get X equals negative pi divided by four, divided by two. X equals pi over four, again, divided by two or multiplied by one half. And then, of course, lastly, the zero doesn't change. Zero divided by two is just zero. And now what we want to do is do a right shift by uh, pi over three here. Now, of course, the, th these aren't very, very friendly with denominators, so we'll do the algebra we need to do in the next step. Uh, sometimes we do it before, but I think it'll be okay in the next step. So we add pi over three to all the x values. So this will be x equals negative pi over four plus pi over three. Do the same here, x equals pi over four plus pi over three. And then of course, lastly, we'll just have pi over three, zero. Now, what we want to do is just convert everything to the least common denominator, which is 12. So let's do that. So while we're at it, we can go ahead and change this one to a 12. So 3 into 12 will be 4. So that'll give us a 4 pi, just so it's easier to plot everything. If we've got nice common denominators, then we can make uh, tick marks on the axes that are easy to, to write, and, and then that makes for a much more accurate graph as opposed to just guessing and, and, and making it wrong. So here we have a 12. So again, the four into the 12 is three, so that's a negative three pi. And then of course, the three into the 12 is four, so that's a four pi. So that gives us pi over 12. Likewise, here we're going to add both times. So we'll get a 3 pi, same as the up, upstairs, except both are positive. So that gives us a 7 pi. Now, what we notice here is that because of the, of the 2 here, when we think of the period, I didn't go ahead and compute this. I mean, we know what the shift is, the phase shift, so to speak. But this is just what? This is pi divided by two. The principal period we know is pi. So we divide that by k to get pi over two. And so when we look at the distance between these two asymptotes, it's just six pi over 12, which is pi over two. So this will always verify the actual period of the function to make sure that all of this is consistent. And then the reason I did this is so it's easy to space all of these uh, x values. So, so again, we can get a reasonable graph of this new function
just using these three objects. And then of course, we're using the fact that we have a relatively good picture of what the parent function looks like. So this will help us to orient the new curve just like we did for sine and cosine. So let's go ahead and draw it. So here's our uh, y axis and we're drawing our x axis. So here's y. Now it, we've just got divisions of 12. So let's just go ahead and write down uh, seven of them. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, like what, what I'm trying to do is spread this out so you get a good picture of how the arithmetic is working. You know, a, a computer generated can be nice and tiny or whatever, that's fine. But I want you to see the actual points that we've computed. And then if you're doing a physics problem or a math problem, you've got the actual value that's gonna be much more useful to you than some guesstimate that, that will just throw the problem off. So now we've got pi over 12 which is a vertical asymptote. And so we, we, we write it correctly, x equals pi over 12. Again, sometimes we do have to think about what we're doing. When you type in a response, it's got to make mathematical sense. And that requires that you think about what you're doing. I think you, if you wrote it on the test and you wrote it wrong, your professors would be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's the same thing with the typing. It's just unfortunate that WebAssign can't read your mind. I, I, you know, that, that, that's, maybe that's the next thing. You'll have, we'll have software where, where it'll, it'll check your eyes or something and it'll figure out what it is you really mean. I don't know, maybe that's, that's too, that's too scary, maybe. Okay, and so now seven, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The other vertical asymptote is here. So we have X equals seven pi over 12. So maybe the problem just says, uh, you know, give the, give the uh, principal asymptotes. And so now what we can see is that these would just all be separated by uh, uh, pi over two. So you could just do like n times pi over two if you wanted to, or write it as n times pi over six and get all the vertical asymptotes. That, that'd be a nice web assign question. So now of course the, uh, the seven, so the point in the middle, the four, so, one, two, three, four, right here. I'll just do this in red. And so now we've got this point and I'll mark it. That's the X value. And so if you will, we can go ahead and extend this down a little bit. and draw our function based on the shape of the uh, parent. So here's a reasonable graph of the principal branch of this tangent function. That is, this is y equals tangent 2x minus 2 pi over 3. And of course, we can, we can replicate each of these and get as many as we like, but this completely defines the graph because this is one complete cycle. So, so again, this reminds you exactly what we've done in the past. There's no, there's no difference. I mean, there's absolutely no difference. If anything, it was less work, but we're doing the same thing that we did before. We're just basically mapping out the transformations, moving the objects that will help us draw the new graph. And of course, since we've got asymptotes, we have to move the asymptotes. And if there's a point 
that's useful are a couple of points. Notice we didn't have any negatives out here, so we didn't actually flip this graph or whatever. But but as long as long as you're if you're doing an x-axis reflection, it's nice to have a point that's not on the axis, so you can actually see that reflection. Um, and so if you need to add an extra point for a tangent or cotangent function, then do it like the the pi over four comma one. That's always an easy point uh, to move around because again, it's off the axis. So so we're seeing here that there's actually no difference. If anything, it's 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 even more straightforward than the sine and cosine. But I think it's nice how you see that the transformations affect the x's and y's just like we would expect them to. Very, very nice, very easy to do. Now, the next set or the actual um, thing that we want to do is to consider the, cos or the cosecant and the secant. And so what I did was just like what we had before. I went ahead and mapped this out just like I did for sine or for tangent and cotangent. Now, what I've done here is it, I kind of let the cat out of the bag. I'm basically saying that we don't get an improvement on the two pi when it comes to secant and cosecant. And why is that? Well, we're not taking ratios in the classical sense. We're just doing the reciprocal of the cosine and sine function. So we're not getting any, you know, extra. You know, for instance, when you're taking ratios, you can basically duplicate. But here we're not, we're just reciprocating values from a function that's two pi periodic. We're not gonna shorten that with that process or that, that particular uh, um, strategy is not gonna shorten the, the period. So we don't expect this to give us an improvement. But let me show you how simple this is to do. Now then you're thinking, well, Professor Ron, did you, did you pick some special piece of the cosine function for, this, for the principal branches? And the answer is yes, but it really wouldn't matter. In general, when you're doing the uh, principal branches of the uh, secant function, what we wanna do is focus on the cycle of cosine that lies between negative pi over two and three pi over two. Normally we just go from zero to two pi if we're doing sine or cosine. But, but what this is going to showcase, at least for this particular interval, is it will be appended on each end by a vertical asymptote. So we don't chop it up. We, we, want, we want the, uh, the principal branches to be showcased in a way so that we have the vertical asymptotes uh, presented in a very neat way. And so this is why we choose this. But again, this will be something you can replicate over and over. Now, so what we do, we start with here, the cosine function right here at negative pi over two is zero. And then of course at zero, we get one, then pi over two, zero, then uh, pi, we get a negative one. And then of course, three pi over two, zero, just thinking about uh, the definition of sine and cosine on the unit circle. So, when we think about reciprocating, that, that's really something that, that should say, okay, well, I know two points that will be easy in the range. That is one and negative one. When you reciprocate those two values, they don't change. So the reciprocal of one here is one and the reciprocal of negative one is here. Now here's, here's where we use the same strategy that we used in the last two examples. As we approach here, let's, for instance, we're, we're on the left and we're approaching pi over two. And we're thinking, okay, well, this is a vertical asymptote right here. That's a zero of cosine. What sign do we attach to infinity? Well, of course, here the graph is above the x-axis. So this part of the branch will ascend to infinity. So we get a positive infinity. But likewise, if we approach the negative pi over two, from the right, as we're doing here, we approach, start here and approach this way. Again, the cosine curve is above the x-axis. That is, it's positive. And so we again assign the positive to the infinity and we get what looks like a happy face, more like maybe a little bit parabolic, but we get, we get a curve 
that's nice and symmetric uh, to this vertical axis. So, so the thing is, is that the reciprocation process is simple for, for the cosine function, and that's why we utilize it. You'll never forget the graph of tangent or cotangent. You'll never forget the graph of, of secant or cosecant, but you do need to remember the graphs of sine and cosine. Those are kind of the building blocks. They're, always remember that so you can get the rest. And now, of course, if we venture to the negative one, we do the same thing. If we approach, again, this is a technique you'll use in calculus. If we approach uh, three pi over two from the left here, we see the curve is below the x-axis with the negative sign. So our secant function will descend to negative infinity. Likewise, as we approach pi over two here from the right, the sine or the actual uh, sine of the cosine function is negative. That is, the graph is below the x-axis, so we append the negative sign to infinity, and the graph descends to negative infinity. So, so you're thinking here, you've got a nice symmetry going on, and you're like, oh, oh, well, wait a minute. Tangent is an odd function. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's look, let's look. We already know this. Tangent is an odd function, right? And cotangent is an odd function. Just let's just remind ourselves of that. Tangent of the additive inverse of x is just the additive inverse of tangent. We're going to get the same uh, for the inverse trig functions, and then I'm going to show you how to get them for all of it, so you won't come to grief uh, later. And then, of course, cotangent is also odd. Let's just write that in just for, for extra. Yeah, that's what, that's what everybody says about Professor Ron. He says, yeah, you always have something additional to say, something extra to say. Well, that's what math does to you. You can't, you can't do a problem without saying, well, look what we can do with this. You know, this even has more information in it. So, so now, with the, with the same idea here, we have a, a, an even function, the secant, cosecant function. Let's write that down excuse me, the secant function is even, just to remind you. We've got that nice symmetry relative to the uh, y-axis that we got for free. Let's go ahead and write that in just to remind ourselves. So now you can see that when we think about this particular function, there's a little bit more going on. I mean, if you think about it, we've got three vertical asymptotes x is negative pi over two, x is pi over two, and x is three pi over two, and we've got these two points off the axis. And so if we really want to get a nice graph of a transformed secant function, we need to know where those objects go. So you're thinking, well, I thought it was gonna be less work. Well, it's kind of like the same amount of work because here we have the five objects that we have with sine and cosine where they were all points. Here, we've got two points and three vertical asymptotes. So if we can figure out the destination of these five objects, then we can draw the graph just like we did for the tangent function. So, so again, the, it's not that we don't want to draw five or six versions of this. We don't have time. We just need what we need and move it forward. And if we need to transfer things, we can easily do that by just adding multiples of pi excuse me, adding multiples of the period. Once you have a point, if you want to get a period way down the line, just add a suitable multiple and you get a new point. So that's not an issue. This completely defines the secant function, the standard secant function. So now when we look at the domain, we're just removing all of the zeros of cosine, which we've done before. Again, same song and dance. We avoid, uh, odd multiples of pi over two. Okay, two n plus one, that's an odd integer. Odd multiples of pi over two. And then of course, we kind of cheat a little bit with the, with the negatives, you know, you don't, you think of an odd number as being, you know, not a multiple of two, you know, th that, that's positive, but we just say, you know, this includes negative one, negative three, negative five, negative seven, et cetera, along with the three, five, seven, 11, et cetera. So now, the range, this is where we have a little bit different. Like I said before, 
Remember you had this no man's land I was telling you about. The cosine function is bounded. And so the values between negative one and one, so if you want to just mark off this as one and negative one, they get lost. We, we keep the one and negative one, but the values in here, they, they get lost because everything is reciprocated. If you reciprocate a number between negative one and one, exclusive, then the result is bigger than one or less than negative one. So we're not gonna get anything in here. So if you start drawing stuff in here, that's, that's completely wrong. So, so again, we're just using intuition with basic, basic arithmetic. What is calculus? What is what, what is what we're doing from the very beginning? Arithmetic. That's all we do in this class. Even though we have these fancy letters and stuff, we're doing arithmetic. What's factoring? Arithmetic. What's a reference number? Arithmetic. It's all arithmetic. I mean, let's face it, we, we, should, we should study number theory until we get to college, and then we'd be better mathematicians. Okay, so now, We've got that now that I've you know beat that into your head. And then of course the vertical asymptotes will just be based upon how we've written the domain. So we get these vertical lines, x equal odd multiples of pi over two. So what I've done here, I've kind of let the cat out of the bag. We get the same periodic nature for secant and cosecant that we have for sine and cosine. So there's no improvement in this case. It's not to say that, that, that we don't get one, it's not a good thing. It's just, there, there's, there's no way to make it smaller like we had with the tangent and cotangent. Now, let's look at the next one and then we'll do an example of this. Let me refocus. So now when we think, okay, so this is why I say principal branches, we had the happy face and the unhappy face, okay? And then when we do the cosecant, what, what's the principal standard, so to speak? We'll use this branch to restrict, to make the inverse secant function, which will be the version that Professor Ron uses that Dr. Stewart in your book doesn't use, uh, basically because in calculus, we, we, want a, we want another version, but that's okay, not to worry. I'll make sure you're guided through that. Now, for the, for the sine function, what we wanna do is we want to take the values, the vertical asymptotes or the zeros of sine that start at negative pi and end at pi. This is what we call the principal branch. And so when we think about this, we think about sine of negative pi, that's just zero, and then sine of uh, negative pi over two, again, sine is an odd function, so we get negative one, and then sine of zero is zero, sine of pi over two is one, and then of course sine of pi is zero, just using the unit circle. So we look at this particular cycle of the sine function. Now, just like we had before, this is you could tell me how to do this. The negative one and the one are fixed. When you reciprocate, the one and negative one do not change. They're, that's what we call fixed points upon reciprocation. And then we do the same setup again. Remember, the no man's land will be here. The one and negative one exclusive, that interval uh, gets just obliterated, so to speak, because everything grows beyond one, greater than one, and less than negative one as we have here. So just like we had before, as we approach pi from the left, the values of the sine are positive. Again, this defines a vertical asymptote because it's division by zero. So that means that the function graph will ascend to infinity. The values become positively infinite. And the same thing over here, as we approach this zero, x equals zero from the right, in this case, excuse me, as we, as we approach this from the right, again, the graph here is positive, so we get positive infinity, just like we did with the sequence. So we get the happy face or the curve that basically is concave upward. Now, as we move over to this branch, past this vertical asymptote, we, we get the opposite effect. Again, as we approach here, zero from the left, here we'll, as we approach from the right, we had the positive sign. As we approach from the left, we have the negative sign. So now the function will descend to negative infinity. Likewise, as we approach negative pi over two from the right, the sign of the curve, sine, is actually negative. So we ascend to negative infinity. So again, 
this sign convention that we're doing now that we've done many times before is, is something you will still have to do in calculus because calculus will only, only verify the fact that around the vertical asymptote, the function becomes infinite. Right now, we've just kind of intuitively decided that that's the case. But the, the definition of, of a vertical asymptote will allow you to apply uh, uh, the calculus and arithmetic to actually verify that the function becomes unbounded. And what that means is that if you just, if, 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 if I want to show or prove that a function becomes positively infinite, as x approaches a certain number, say two from the left, you're going to throw out. You say, "Here, Professor Ron, here's a here's a positive number." So you give me that positive number, and then I have to prove that my function can actually become bigger than that positive number for some value to the left of two, and then I've done it. Since your number was arbitrary, then I've proven the fact that the function does become infinite. As, as say, for instance, x approaches two from the left. So, so the, the, the analytical arguments, again, become arithmetic, but, but, but they're a little bit more tenuous. And so we, we say that to calculus, but, but you'd be surprised how, how adept you will be at doing this because we've, we've started the process here. So now when we actually want to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, we say, okay, well, we want to avoid division by zero so the domain will include no multiples of pi. And then of course the range, like we said before, we have the gap. So we have what? Negative infinity to negative one inclusive and then one inclusive to positive infinity here. So this will be useful when we define the inverse secant function. We, we won't focus so much on the inverse uh, cosecant just because we Calculus doesn't focus much on it, and I'll tell you why. And then, of course, the vertical asymptotes just using the domain here uh, will be vertical lines that are multiples of, of pi. So again, these multiples of pi, you can just string them along and add your branches uh, to write as many cycles as you want. So again, the periodic function is our friend because it repeats. Uh, all we need is one complete cycle. So now what I want to do is do another example where we apply the transformation process to maybe a secant function. And um, I address this one up a little bit. Let's see, here we go. Let's do graph using transformations. graph using transformations. And so here's the function. I added a negative sign just to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, y equals negative one third, just to give us some practice with the reflection uh, in the x-axis, negative one third secant and we've got two pi x minus pi. So just like I said before, we, we still we still have some vertical stuff going on here because the, the function is broken into two branches. So so we don't really have an amplitude, but we do have an actual distinct minimum and maximum point. With the, with the secant function because of, of, of the way we've actually constructed them as reciprocals. So, so I guess maybe it's kind of like a quasi amplitude, but still not there. So what we want to do is factor here the two pi so we can get the k value. Uh, remember, we want the x to have a coefficient of one. So we get negative one third secant and we have two pi this is a little bit easier, and that'll be an x. And of course, we factor we factor the pi from the pi, and that leaves a one. But we've got a two out here, so to dress it up, we need a one half. That is now when you multiply through, you get the negative pi, which we have here, and of course, you get the two pi x. Uh, 
So this is this is all ready to go for our mapping proper uh, mapping principle, so to speak. So so again, we changed the period, we've compressed it, and then we've got a right shift here, and then we've got a vertical compression and then a reflection. So we've got four things going on here. So forgive me for the extra negative, but I thought I'd just throw that in just for some extra practice. So we have secant x. Again, as you work through these, you can streamline the process. I'm being very thorough here because I want you to get, get some good techniques here. You can add and subtract things as you need. So notice the first thing we wanna do is we want to replace the x with two pi x. So this will be h compression, since that's much bigger than one, h compression by two pi. So we get secant, 2 pi x. And now, of course, we need the x to be replaced with x minus 1 half. So this will be a right shift by 1 half. So we have secant. I'll go ahead and use the brackets 2 pi x minus one half. Have students say this is a this is an interesting way to do this, Professor Ron. I said I, I don't know how else you would do it if you want to understand it. So I, I I'm amazed that 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 my techniques seem to be strange to people at first, but 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 if you're actually going to teach it to someone, you need to express it in a way that makes sense. And this this is so clear. And so now we're thinking, okay, let's do the easy part. Uh, we can do the vertical compression by one and then we'll do the x-axis reflection or vertical compression by three. So B compression by three. So that's gonna be a one third secant two pi x minus one half. And then, of course, the x-axis reflection is the negative sign. So x-axis reflection. And I'll do this right below since I've got much space right there. So we got negative one-third secant 2 pi x minus 1 half. So so we got the mapping here. So now all we need to do is just look at the objects. Now remember with the uh, uh, cosine or cosine function, we had the negative pi over two, the pi over two and the three pi over two. So we got, well, let me just remind you. Right here, we've got the x equal negative pi over two, x equal pi over two and three pi over two vertical asymptotes. And then these two points here, zero, one, and pi negative one. That's where we want we want to move those. So let's write them down. So we have x equals negative pi over two. X equals pi over two. And then x equals three pi over two. And then we've got the point uh, zero one and then pi negative one. So just think about the just think about the cosine function right there to get those. And these are easy, just think about the zeros. So those make the vertical asymptotes. So these aren't hard to remember. I just wanted to reference the, the graph that we uh, came up with. And so now we want h compression by two pi. So we need to divide all the x values by two pi. So I'll write those out. So x equals negative pi over two times one over two pi. So the pi is absorbed and we get a negative one fourth. And then of course here we have x equals pi over two times one over two pi. The pi is absorbed and we just get one fourth. And then here we have x equals, 
3 pi over 2 multiplied by uh, 1 over 2 pi. Again, the pi is absorbed and we have 3 quarters. And then, of course, if we divide 0 by 2 pi, that doesn't change. And then, of course, here, if we divide by 2 pi, the pi, that leaves a 1 half. So the, the thing is, it looks like we've got everything with a 4 in the denominator. So we might as well go ahead and write this one that way, too. 2 over 4 to the negative 1. And then, of course, if we want to right shift by one half, let's just say one half equals two over four for simplicity. We want, we want to be able to graph things uh, with the same denominators. And it doesn't matter when you do it, but, but you want your picture to look good. And so uh, this will be good practice when you're doing lab exercises in physics or whatever, and pressure physics professor, do things neatly. You know, don't just say, well, I put it in a calculator. You know what? You do, you do a good thing to put your calculator away and exercise your brain. Um, our, our world, our country will continue to plummet mathematically because our international friends still do it the old fashioned way like I do it. And they occasionally use a Google calculator, but that's why they are rising above us because we think we're just so special that we're going to use the technology and, and, and become less efficient. I mean, technology is, 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 is a blessing. Don't get me wrong, but we cannot use the technology as a substitute for our brain. So now we're going to add 2 over 4 to all the x values. So let's do it. So we get x. So 2 plus a negative 1 is just 1. Here we have 2 plus 1, so that gives us a 3. Here uh, we've got what? Uh, 2 uh, plus 3, which gives us a 5. And then, of course, we get what? 2 over 4, 1. And then, uh, in this particular case, we get uh, 2 over 4 plus 2 over 4. That's 4 over 4, negative 1. So we keep everything with a four downstairs, don't reduce it so we can easily graph these. So these are all nice numbers that we can easily plot, but we're not quite finished. So now we need to uh, do the B compression by three. So divide the Y coordinates by three, but of course that's not gonna affect the vertical asymptotes because those are X values. So these are the same, we'll just be a court reporter here. And then we'll get a one third, right? So we have two over four comma one third. And then we get a four over four comma negative one third. And then lastly, we'll do a X axis reflection, which means, excuse me, replace the Y values with their additive inverses or negatives. So these don't change, but these will change. So you don't, you don't even have to repeat these again if you don't want. I'm just trying to emphasize the fact that they don't change. So you don't think I'm leaving them out. But, but of course, if you're doing a test or something and you're just trying to figure out vertical asymptotes, you'll say, well, those don't change the BA, so I'm not worried about them. So you're done. So we have two over four negative one third, and then four over four, positive one third. So this defines the new graph. So again, just like we did before, even though this, this is a little bit more busy arithmetically, we want to be able to have new objects, namely points and asymptotes that are easy to draw, easy to sketch. Again, again, you think about it, um, what, do we, what do we want with our technology? What's the first thing we say when we get a new device? We say, well, it's not very user friendly. You know, we expect everything to be perfect. You know, we get a new phone and we think it's great for a day and then a week later we're ready to throw it away and we paid, what, $1,500 for it. You know, let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, everything we want to be user friendly. 
But when we're doing a math problem, we're trying to help ourselves out. So if we do this with a user-friendly touch, then it's going to be easier to answer questions. So the thing about the cell phones, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, criticizing anyone. I'm even criticizing myself because I, I get a new phone and I think it's great for two days. And then I'm like, ah, it's not perfect. So yeah, I have to laugh at myself. So now, We've got the uh, y-axis, and I'll just go ahead and mark this off. So we've got like a one here, so we get a one-third here. And then you see about one here, and then well, let's make it a little bit lower. Let's see here, about right there. Okay. So there's negative one and negative one third. And so for the x-axis, we've just got uh, fourths. So we'll do zero, one, two, three, four, five. And that should be sufficient. So now the vertical asymptotes, we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So we've got a one fourth and a three fourths. So let's go ahead and draw this one in. So this gives us, I'll just say, x equals one fourth, and then the uh, three fourths. So we have x equals three fourths, and then the five fourths. And then we've got our two points off the axis. So note here, this is uh, two fourths to three, four, and this is four fourths, just marking off the x-axis. So we get two fourths, negative one third, all right here. And we get four fourths, one third, all right here. And then of course, we can just use the fact that we have the shape of the parent function to descend to negative infinity here. there, and then the same here, to ascend to infinity. Do the same here. So now we've got our new function and you're thinking, well, that just looks like the regular function. You're exactly right, but it's flipped, but it's all coordinatized. So this point here is, well, let's just write it in, two-fourths, negative one-third. This point here is four-fourths, positive one-third. So it's all coordinatized. We've got our vertical asymptotes, which you can write down in generality that completely identifies this function and it's shifted. I mean, let's think about it. We've taken the period and we've compressed it. We've shifted it to the right. And we've actually, uh, <laughs> you're thinking when we're, when we're compressing vertically with the one third, it's, it's yeah, but, but the function becomes infinite. So it's really making it more infinite. I don't know. When, when, when the function values become unbounded, the, the vertical compression and, and, and uh, stretching don't really make any sense anymore, but, but it's okay. You see, you see we still work it the same way. So in essence, the, uh, the, the value, the y value uh, descends in one case and ascends in the other case. So we get a nice uh, a graph here.
So, so again, the amplitude uh, portion of everything doesn't really work for us anymore. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk about the inverse trig functions. So this, this is basic and just gives you a good way to look at the uh, functions, the remaining uh, four functions that, that we have with the uh, unit circle. Now, the next thing we want to do is talk about the inverse trig functions. Now, this is quick. You're thinking, well, which ones do we talk about? And we pretty much focus on four of them, not that we're trying to discriminate. It's just that the calculus starts to overlap and we don't really care so much about all of them. But there are four that we want to spend some time on. And that'll be the inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, and inverse secant. So let's write these down. So what we're going to do is basically say y is equal to sine x. And we're going to restrict its domain to make it one to one. So we're going to let x run from negative pi over 2. So this is going to be our construction of a one-to-one -one function so we can define an inverse sine function. So this is a basic construction that will work for us in calculus, even though there are other ways to do this. So what we do is we say, okay, well, what does this look like? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna use what we know about the sine function. And we know on this particular interval, it is increasing, at least based on what we know about it. So we have negative pi over 2, and we have pi over 2, and we have 1 and negative 1. So sine of negative pi over 2 is negative 1, and sine of pi over 2 is, is 1, and we can draw it. So there's our sine function that, that's restricted. So this is y equals sine x restricted. And because it's restricted, it is one to one. Now, of course, it takes the calculus to verify explicitly that this is truly an increasing function on this interval. And if it is increasing, then we know it's one to one. It doesn't backtrack at all. So it is one to one if we at least assume the fact that we know the calculus will support this. And so now with this particular piece of the sine function, we define the inverse sine function. So define the inverse sine function. And we'll use the same independent variable. So we want to reflect this graph in the line y equal x and then use x as the independent variable. So we're going to say y is equal to the inverse sine of x as long as x lives. Well, now the new domain will be the uh, range of the sine function between negative 1 and 1. That is, when we look at this, we're thinking the new domain will be here and the new range will be here. So that will give us inverse equations. Now, I just want to give you an alternate way to write this. Stewart uses the minus one, but Larson will use arc sine. Another way to say inverse sine of x is to write arc sine. This is used widely. This is used more so, but this is still used. I don't, I don't use this personally. I'm more focused on using this. I, I dislike this because as a kid, the uh, uh, Swakowski text that we used at Carolina uses this, fun, this uh, particular notation. But this is fine too. You can say arc sine. So if you see this, it means this and vice versa. So don't be surprised by this. Now, with this, we get some nice inverse equations. That is, 
and, and I want to do these in the right order because I always like to do the sine first. Sine of inverse sine of x. This is the identity if we respect the domain of the sine function. So this means if and only if x lives between negative one and one. And then two, we can flip it around and should still get the identity function. This is what gives kids, you know, problems and we'll work on these next class. This will be the identity function, if and only if we end up in the range, and that will be negative pi over two uh, to uh, pi over two. So the idea here, and this is very important, is that now with the new function, we've got a new domain and a new range because they just flip flop and then the inverse sine function is actually odd. I want you to know this. It helps in computations. It's an odd function too. So you can expect its graph to look symmetric relative to the origin and we can easily draw it. So I need, you need to know all of this. These are the pieces, so to speak. So now these just flip. So now we've got what negative one to one. And then we have pi over two and negative pi over two. So now, again, these are horizontal tangents in calculus. So they become vertical tangents in the uh, inverse. Horizontals become vertical, vertical become horizontal, you know, same song and dance. So again, um, negative pi over two, negative one becomes negative one, negative pi over two, and pi over two, one becomes one pi over two. They just flip. So now we have the verticals, vertical tangent. So here's y equal inverse sine of x. And so you, you look at this and say, that's crazy. That's just the flip of this. You, these reflect in the line y equal x. And the thing is, the thing is, is that the, the nature is what we've been doing all along. Domain becomes range range becomes domain. The inverse equations must obey the inputs here. That is, this domain of the inverse sign must be obeyed, so x must live here. Here, the range of the inverse sign must be obeyed, so the x must live here in the range. So, and then this fact that it's odd, use it, use it to good health. So, learn this. This is our introductory uh, presentation of the inverse sign. And to be honest with you, it'll be sufficient to do calculus. And you'll add more to it as you go along. You're going to learn the calculus of the inverse sine function. So this is a very correct, very introductory approach to the inverse sine function, and it will serve you well. So basically, what we're going to do is take the unit circle and read it backwards. We think of a distance along the unit circle to a terminal point. Now we're going to go from the terminal point to the distance along the unit circle. We're just going to go backwards. What is the inverse function? It's just the backwards path. Everything I've told you is correct. And I will always go by the same wording. Uh, even though it may confound you, it will be completely consistent. Because that's how you teach math. And that's how you know math. Now you're thinking, well, are we done? No, we got three more. Now, the inverse cosine is not one of the favored inverse trig functions. However, it is utilized, but 
the derivative of the inverse sine is just the negative of the derivative of the inverse cosine. That's why we don't really care about it because negatives are no big deal. When we do integral tables, we focus on inverse sine, but that's okay. But we, we still do utilize the inverse cosine, so I wanna talk about it. So here's the next one. So we'll say y equals cosine x. Now, what we wanna do is make sure that we take a piece of this that is what? One to one. So for the inverse sine and the inverse cosine, these definitions are universal. And unfortunately, it's not that way for inverse secant. And why? I have no idea. You'd think by now we would have decided, but it's not the case. So what we're gonna do is take x to live between zero and pi. And if you think about the cosine function, that's an interval on which the cosine decreases. Let's draw it. So we have one, let's just mark this off. We have one and we have negative one. And we have zero pi over two, and we have pi. And so we have zero, let's just go ahead and draw it. We've got a nice decreasing function, at least calculus will verify this. And so again, the horizontal, horizontal tangents will become vertical tangents. So this is y equal cosine x restricted. And it's one to one. So again, the function is actually decreasing here. And with this piece, we define the inverse sine function, excuse me, inverse cosine function. So define inverse cosine function. Now, I'm not doing this for any reason except you need to learn these. And I mean learn them so that it's like boom, right up here, like the unit circle. Otherwise, you will come to grief. And I don't want that. I want you to know this. So please take the time to learn this. So we say y is equal to the inverse cosine. I'm going to go ahead and just write beside it the arc cosine as an alternative way of writing this. So you can see cosine to the minus one superscript or arc cosine, and in this case, x lives, again, between negative one and one. So we've got the new domain for the inverse cosine function. And just like the inverse sine, it has the, uh, trend, uh, the inverse equations. So we have cosine of inverse cosine of x is x as long as we respect the domain of the inverse cosine. And then the inverse cosine of cosine of x, again, is the identity x, as long as we respect the range of the inverse cosine, zero to pi. So you thought, well, that's kind of interesting. They chose this. Again, this is a universal selection. So when you see the inverse cosine, it is always defined this way. Of course, you have inverse hyperbolic cosine, which is something you should have talked about in Cal 1. Uh, well, not should have, we'll talk about in Cal 1. I'm thinking, my goodness, my students are in pre-Cal. Good, so don't worry about that last comment. How funny. And so then you're thinking, does this have a nice property with negative arguments. Not really, it's not even, it's not odd, but there is a formula that we're gonna use. 
the inverse cosine of negative x is actually pi. You can think of this in terms of transformation is actually pi minus the inverse cosine of x. So this allows you to work with negative arguments so you don't lose your mind. Again, it's not, the inverse cosine is not odd, nor is it even, but it does obey this identity. And so we will use it. And it's not hard to prove, but right now we wanna focus on using this when necessary. So what does the picture look like? So we've got negative one to one. And we've got our zero, pi over two, and pi. And so now we just take the flip of all these numbers. This is pi uh, negative one, so we do negative one pi. This is pi over two zero, so we do zero pi over two. And this is zero, one, so we do one, zero. And now we have vertical tangents. So here's our inverse cosine function. Again, here we have vertical tangents. Horizontal tangents become vertical tangents. So this is y equal inverse cosine. If you know this picture, you know the range and domain of the inverse cosine. If you know range and domain of inverse cosine, you know the inverse equations. And then, of course, every time you write this, this is just like a log equation. You can just say x equals cosine y. Apply cosine to both sides. They say the same thing. I haven't been writing that part down because that's obvious. That's what we did with logs and, co uh, logs and exponentials. But this is always true, and that'll be useful to us also. So, so the, the thing is, one and two are important for computation. This is important for computation. This is important to know what the function is as far as its definition, okay? So, so usually students are better off if they kind of commit the picture of it to, to memory, and then from this, you can get all of this. I think it might be a little bit easier. Okay, now let's look at the inverse tangent. Inverse tangent is pretty quick because you know we just got that principal branch that that is easy. So number three, let y equal tangent x, and let's just restrict to the principal branch where x is between negative pi over two and pi over two, like that. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, we know what it looks like. We just drew it. So here we've got pi over two, uh, excuse me, negative pi over two, pi over two. So x equals negative pi over two, x equals pi. There is no reason why you should not understand the graphs of these functions because you know these, you know the other graphs if we restrict them. So if you put these down, write them down three or four times, you will have them mastered, okay? It won't re mean that you'll forget, remember them forever, but you can always dredge them back up if you need to. So remember, this looks like this. So here's the tangent function restricted. 
restricted. That's just the principal branch. And the calculus will verify that this is indeed increasing. So it's one to one. One to one functions define inverses. So define inverse tangent. So this will be y equal inverse tangent of x equal, again, the other way to write it is arc, arc tan. The reason I like the minus one is because it reminds me of inverse. That's the reason, and that's how I learned it. But there's nothing wrong with arc tan. That's fine too. Some of you, some of my students like it better. They do their work with arc tan, arc sine. And of course, here, what's the what's the range? All 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 real. So this will be just x is any number, negative infinity to infinity. That's why students like the arctan, and it it appears a lot. It is ubiquitous in mathematics, probability analysis. So so we get we get this nice deal because the range is all real numbers, and so we get of course the inverse equations that so we have tangent tangent of inverse tangent of x, we must obey the a domain, this is x, when x is any real number. That's why students like it, they never confound this. Can't mess that one up. And then two, inverse tangent of tangent of x will now be x as long as we obey the range of the inverse tangent which will be between negative pi over two and pi over two. The problem is, is that some of the most important stuff you do is in this class that gets you ready for calculus because what you learn here makes you comfortable in calculus. If you don't get this part in pre-cal, then when you get to the calculus of inverse trig functions, it's not gonna make any sense. So this, we need to really put in the brain and, and get these definitions down. Now, another thing is, is that the inverse tan function is odd. So another, another freebie. The inverse tangent function, when we deal with negative arguments, they factor. So this is like the inverse sine. It's an odd function. So you, you expect the graph to look like it has uh, uh, origin symmetry, and it does. So now, of course, it's easy to draw. The vertical asymptotes become horizontal. And how simple is that? <laughs> you think somebody just woke up one day, well, I, I think I'll just define the inverse trig functions. Hmm, sounds like something interesting. Well, maybe so. Maybe if that's how it happened, that's really good because they have proven to be very rich in, in mathematics. So we get pi over two and negative pi over two. And now, of course, we're approaching negative pi over two, but then we're flipping in the line y equal x. So this will approach this, but then move up in an increasing manner. Increasing, also increasing. Vertical tangent. So here's y equal inverse tangent of x. So this is easy to remember. It kind of looks like the, the cube root function, kind of like a snake, but it doesn't grow like the inverse, uh, the one third function or the cubic function because it's bounded. But this is so nice in calculus when you do improper integrals and you know the inverse tangent function is bounded. You boom, you've got you've got the bounds. You got pi over two, negative pi over two. It's such it's such a nice function and it occurs in the integral form all over the place. 
it's even used to define a probability distribution function. So, so the inverse tangent is a useful, useful object in calculus and, and in analysis, analysis in general. So again, this is the most user-friendly of the inverse trig functions. I mean, excuse me, domain all real numbers, how simple is that? The branch, no big deal. Easy to remember. You will remember this before you remember any of them. Trust me, this will, this is, I bet this is already up here. Now the inverse secant, I'll go ahead and apologize for that. It, it is, is a somewhat troublesome, but let me show you how to work with it. So inverse tangent. Now remember with the inverse secant, I'm gonna give you a form that Dr. Ron Larson uses. That's the calculus book that I use. And um, we wanna go with the form that preserves the reciprocal identity. Now, Dr. Stewart, who's written your pre-cal book, actually has written a very successful calculus book. Dr. Larson and Dr. Stewart, I think they're competitors when it comes to the calculus book. But Stewart uses a different definition. Now, I don't think I really cared one way or another, but when I uh, got to uh, Sanjak and I started using Larson and I saw some of the benefits of his definition, I I've come around to his definition. But, but again, it just really depends on your experience. But since uh, uh, I use that at Sanjak, I will use Dr. Larson's definition. So we want to start with this. Y is equal to secant X. Now, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna set this up so we can get a one-to-one -one function? Well, what we wanna do is make sure that what we, ever, what we choose is actually increasing. So it's necessarily one-to-one. -one. So we're gonna set X to live here between zero and pi over two. And of course, pi over two is an asymptote. So we'll use a parenthesis there, union pi over two to pi. This will give us a nice increasing P. So let, let's just go ahead and draw it. Okay, now we've got the zero here. And let's put in the pi over two, let's see, right there. We're just doing, using a piece of each of the princi principal branches. So here's the zero, here's the pi over two, here's the pi, and we have one, and we have negative one. So we've got this point here, zero, one, and it increases like this way, that increasing piece. And then over here, we do the same. That is now we've got the, um, the, Remember on the graph, we get negative one pi on the inverse. So we've got pi negative one right here. And we increase to that point. So this is the piece that we use to define the inverse secant function. We take this part because increase, increase one to one. So we say y equals secant x restricted. And the restricted part is one to one. Again, we, Dr. Larson chooses the increasing pieces of the principal branches. So if this function increases, so does this inverse. So that's important. This is the most difficult, but again, you just, you're taking two increasing pieces of the, of the, of the secant function. Uh, Stewart takes this piece over here, which is not increasing. 
So it doesn't preserve the reciprocal identity. So eh, that's why I'm kind of more of a fan of this. So we will define, define the inverse secant. inverse secant function, if you want to say function, usually I just leave that off, but I think I've said it once before. So we're going to say y equals inverse secant with a negative 1x, or you can do the arc seek, arc secant. Now, if you look here, you're seeing that the new domain becomes what? Let's kind of mark that off. Negative infinity to negative one, one to infinity. So here, x lives here. So that's the new domain. So again, the domain and range flip. And then the reciprocal or the actual inverse equations will do secant of inverse secant equals x. If and only if we respect the uh, domain of the inverse secant. Now, of course, if you wanted to be crafty, you could just write this as x in absolute value greater than or equal to one. That means the same thing. That's just a disjunction. So most students prefer this because it's more visual. But that's, of course, we love absolute value. That's our friend. So if you want to write it that way, be my guest. And two, inverse secant of secant of x is x if and only if we respect the range of the inverse secant so x lives here or this part zero pi over two union pi over two to pi now like i said before there the inverse secant function doesn't have the even, nor does it have the odd property, but we do have a way to deal with the negative arguments, which is similar to that for the inverse cosine. And also, this definition, like I said before, uh, preserves the reciprocal or the uh, reciprocal identity. So here are two really useful facts. The first one looks like this. Inverse secant of x, students find this in, interest, uh, useful when they're doing uh, calculus. This is equivalent to the inverse cosine of 1 over x. So that's, a very, that's the reciprocal identity. Reciprocal identity. And that's what's important. With the other definition, you don't get this. It's no good. It has to be modified. And then, of course, the inverse secant of the negative argument, that is the additive inverse, how do we deal with the negative sign? How do we deal with the additive inverse? Well, we do this like we did with the inverse cosine. We have pi minus inverse secant of x. So ability to deal with negative, the negatives in the arguments are very important, even if it's not, um, I mean, the luxury we have with the basic trig functions, they're odd or even, no problem there. We have what, four odd and two even. With the inverse trig functions, inverse sine is, is uh, uh, odd, and inverse tangent is odd, but of the other two that we've been studying, they're neither. They don't, they're not, they're neither odd nor even, but they have this identity. So, so again, 
we do really need to negotiate that negative with the argument, and this helps us to do it. Now, with that said, what does the graph look like? Well, it looks like this if we invert this in the line y equal x and just flip the coordinates. So remember, now this vertical asymptote will become horizontal. So draw the x-axis. So remember, this is the Larson definition. This is not the Stewart definition. So you need to use this one. So we get our pi over two and our pi right here. So we have y equal pi over two. And then we have pi here. Now notice we can we can use these points. Uh, this point is zero one, so it becomes one zero. And then it increases to the vertical, excuse me, the horizontal asymptote. Vertical tangent. So again, this function increases, so does the inverse function. That's, that's easy to prove. That doesn't even require calculus. You could, you could prove that. And then negative one. So here we have pi negative one, that becomes negative one pi. We, we like using the same variable, even though in terms of some properties of calculus, it's better to keep the variable separate. We like to be able to graph them on the same set of axes. So that's kind of what we tie ourselves into. And it's okay, we, we're used to it. So now we got negative one pi right up here. And now of course, remember, we have to increase into this point. So it would have to go reflecting this way if we reflect this in the line y equal x, we get something that goes like this. So this will have to root this way. So that reflective property is very useful. Right there. So here's our inverse secant. Now again, like I said before, horizontal tangent here, vertical tangent. Horizontal tangent here, vertical tangent. So we would not expect the derivative to exist at these two points due to vertical tangency. You can't define the slope of a vertical line, it's undefined. So, so you know, you're thinking, oh wow, isn't that great? Every, all these problems that we deal with in pre-cal and college algebra stay around to haunt us and be a thorn in our side in calculus. Well, my friends, if division by zero didn't exist, there wouldn't be much calculus to study because calculus is basically the arithmetic study of singularities. That is, when things are undefined, how do we, how do we deal with it? You know, when we define a derivative, we're thinking it's a difference quotient. So that a derivative exists has to do with the fact that the numerator uh, gets to zero quicker than the denominator does. And you're thinking, my goodness, all this arithmetic is going on behind the scenes and we just get to ride the wave with it until we get to some issues and then we have to know what we're doing to be able to unravel them. So when it comes to the inverse secant, ladies and gentlemen, this will be the definition that I will use. And this will be the definition that I'll use in the calculus. So again, remember, remember, this definition uses an increasing portion of the secant function. Therefore, the inverse function is increasing and it gives you the reciprocal identity here because of that definition. And then of course, to deal with negative arguments, we can use this. Now, WebAssign loves to do problems like this. These are the favorite. These are what will confound you because if X doesn't live in here, then you have to fix this with reference angles, reference numbers, and things like that, which I've taught you. 
So there will be room to practice your knowledge of these constructions with the web assign. And you may think at this point, that's the most useless thing in the world, but my friends, it will help you to understand the way we have defined these functions and then allow us to move everything forward. Because this right now is our foundation for inverse trig functions. So, so you have to kind of grab onto it and say, okay, this is fine, I'll learn this. And as you learn more calculus, you're gonna learn more and more and more, just like we had to kind of accept certain things about logarithms and exponents, when you get to calculus, you'll fill in some of the gaps, but everything you've learned will still be accurate and true and very useful, okay? Well, listen, uh, what we'll do uh, next class, we will do some computations with the inverse trig, and then we'll start talking about uh, uh, measurements on the unit circle, arc length, a degree measure, sector area, and do some fun problems that I think you might remember from high school physics or something. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm thinking you all do different things now, but, but we will move in that direction. And then after we get through that, we'll start talking about imposing the triangles on the unit circle. So all of the fun stuff that, that we're gonna keep doing uh, will continue to keep you busy, but will prepare you that much for calculus. So thank, thank you for your attendance today. I appreciate your hard work, keep working. Don't give up, don't, well, don't stop working, not give up, you're, you're doing well. Just keep working until it's over. And when it's over, you can prop your feet up and, and enjoy life and, and, and know that you have a good semester under your belt. So thank you everyone. We'll see you on Thursday, if not before at the conference hours. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Have a good day.